started. Uh, um, okay, so uh, I'm Yajing Liu from McGill University. Um, I'm a seismologist and I'm tasked to talk about fault and seismicity for this um, fault zone course. Uh, what I did is um, I brought my another class of my students from earthquake physics and geology class. So there are five of them here approximately. <laughs> and then, um, so they're gonna join us um, on this session, but they will do a different lab as um, the rest of the class will do. So we'll see how this works. Um, right, so Laurent gave me a warning that um, most of the COIN students haven't had much of seismology uh, except the basics of seismic waves. Um, so I'm just going to go probably from a pretty basic level about how seismology and basically the study of earthquakes can be used to understand fault deformation. And the point here is not to, at least my understanding, is not to teach the seismology, exactly how to analyze seismic waves and get to all those um, velocity structure or earthquake source parameters. Hard time, where did I face? <laughs> um, but really to use the knowledge that we can extract from seismology to earthquake seismology, earthquake geodesy, and how we can use that kind of information to understand the fault zone deformation. Um, right, so I, I put a quote here from Charlie Richter, who was a very prominent seismologist um, in the previous century. What he said is much of what's known about earthquakes follows from the study of the motion of the ground. So um, it's very hard for us to directly measure the properties of the earth materials, um, especially when it comes to the seismogenic depth. So we're going to rely on what we can see on the surface from seismometers, from GPS stations, from INSAR, from other types of um, measurements, try to understand the process of earthquakes. All right, here we go. Um, right, so we all know this is the planet of Earth that we try to study. And the big piece of the puzzle is the dynamic part of earthquakes. Right? Most of the earthquakes occur along play boundaries. So we're trying to understand how the seismicity are trying to tell us about those false dynamics. And I'm going to go from the very beginning of the elastic rebound model that some of you probably have seen from your intro geophysics class. Um, so the idea of an elastic re rebound model is that at the very beginning of the earthquake cycle, there was no deformation. And the, um, the picture here, basically the picture A shows here that if you're assuming that we're looking at the boundary between North America and Pacific plate, this is a right lateral strike slip fault. And we have a, a fence, which was perfectly sitting well across the play boundary. So at the beginning of the earthquake cycle, there was no deformation at all. There was, well, there was deformation of previous earthquakes that, um, let's see if this works, that you can see from those markers, those are permanent markers of previous earthquake deformation, but there was no, no deformation that you can associate with the current time. Now, as we enter this earthquake cycle, because of the far field loading of the two plate, te what, two tectonic plates, there is going to be strain accumulated across, well, across and along the play boundary here. And specifically, we're talking about the friction that's trying to hold the tectonic plates together. So there will be still zero deformation if we're sitting exactly along on the fault. But we're going to have gradually changing or gradually increasing deformation as we move away from the fault. And that shape of the deformation, which is highlighted by the shape of the fence, is approximately an actangent function. We're going to come to that later. So this interseismic period is going to last for, depend on what's the loading rate, what's the frictional properties of um, the fault that's holding them together, it's going to last for decades or hundreds of years or even over a thousand years for some really long um, earthquake cycles. 
But eventually, the strain energy is building up to a level that cannot be held up by the um, false strength anymore, or the stress has exceeded the strength level. And this is when a dynamic event like earthquake would occur. And this is what the final plot is showing here, that finally we're having a finite offset of the fence or of the two parts of the fence. And this is where fault deformation is catching up with far field deformation. And this cycle is going to repeat and repeat in the perfect world if everything is periodically, um, strictly periodic. Now, one thing that I didn't touch on here, or one thing that was not touched on by this elastic rebound model is post seismic deformation. So post seismic deformation is in a way at the same sense as co seismic deformation, but gradually catching up so that everything will add up to a perfect cycle where the finite offset will be the same as we move across the fault. That's a conceptual model for explaining earthquake cycle. Uh, we can also try to be more quantitative here. Well, still a bit conceptual on the left side. On the left side is showing how we expect if we have this characteristic stick stick event. Tau two will be the friction on the fault and tau one is going to be the strength of the fault material. So what this means is that as I'm moving with time within the earthquake cycle, stress on the fault will be increasing gradually up to the point that it reaches the strength of the fault and then will be reduced abruptly during the earthquake. Correspondingly, if we check the displacement or cumulative displacement along the fault, we're seeing no displacement because that's interseismic locking period. This is as if we're sitting exactly at the center of the fence, right on the play boundary, and you're going to have a finite slip corresponding to that earthquake. Well, the different models try to characterize this kind of balance between the stress on the fault and the strength on the fault and how that stress is accumulating and is being released during those earthquake cycles. So we're, at this moment, we're not going to get into the details of the time predictable or sleep predictable models, but we just stick with the simple earthquake cycle model that earthquakes generate or cycles are being generated because of the stress accumulating and release processes. And on the right side is a real world example of what we call earthquake cycles along the, um, so this is Southwestern Japan. I don't know if guys are familiar with the area here, but this is, um, this is a Shikoku area, Nankai Trough, and then Tonankai is over there. And then move further north, we have Tokyo, um, all those major cities. Kyoto is actually right at the middle there. So um, this is Southwestern Japan subduction zone, where they have a lot of good records of paleo earthquake activity. So what the sataki san has compiled here is to, for each of the previous MAC thrust earthquakes, he has characterized the time, which is on this y-axis here, and the extent along the strike or along the trench where the earthquake was affirmed or inferred to have ruptured. Basically, what we're seeing here is, for example, for this segment and the segment next to it corresponds to the 1944 and 1946 magnitude 8 thrust earthquakes. Um, in the Nankai and Tonankai area. And then if we go back in history, we can try to, ooh, wow. If we go back to history, we can see how the cycles are being repeated, but without very nice, beautiful, strict periodicity. So earthquakes could be repeating at different hundreds of years of cycle, and they could expanding to different 
a long strike extent depending on their um, position within the cycle. So what we're trying to get here, or what I'm trying to get here is earthquake cycle in seismology, we're not talking about strictly repeating events of exactly identical slope, magnitude, and spatial extent. But we're looking at, for a specific area, variations in time as well as variations in space. Now, um, just to get a bit into the earthquake cycle again, uh, what I have tried to plot here is a time evolution of one earthquake cycle where uh, we would have earthquakes. They are dynamic ruptures with time scales of a fraction of a second or hundreds of seconds, depends on how big this event is. And following the earthquake, we would have post-seismic deformation after slip. Sometimes we use the two terms interchangeably. And then that period also changes from hours to days or even to decades. Like, for example, we're still seeing post-seismic deformation of the 1960 Chile earthquake as of today. And we have decades, hundreds of years of inter-seismic loading period. So this used to be our understanding of how the earthquake cycle looks like uh, for a major play boundaries. I'm using major play boundary as, as a good example for uh, illustrating earthquake cycles. Now that picture has changed as we start to monitor real time GPS time series, especially here, this is Vancouver Island. And these dots here representing the beginning of the Western Canada permanent GPS network. Um, of course, this has evolved further into, or partly to the south of the border, into the play boundary observatory network where thousands of permanent GPS stations are being put along the west coast to try to characterize the subduction um, of Cascadia toward North America. Um, to the north, the subduction of Alaska, and to the south, the St. Andrews Fault formation as well. But one product out of this continuous GPS monitoring network is something we call slow sleep events or episodic slow sleep events. Um, I'm gonna come to this at the very end of this lecture, um, but, but really what they're saying is that instead of being very, very quiet during this hundreds of years interseismic period, the play boundary is actually doing something very interesting, having slow earthquakes. Earthquakes are releasing moment magnitude equivalent to magnitude five or six, but release that kind of energy over the period of weeks or even months. So um, this is, at least in my opinion, the current understanding of the spectrum of fault de deformation in the earthquake cycle. So we're going to try to focus on um, both the dynamic co-seismic, post-seismic, inter-seismic, but also toward the end, a little bit of the slow slip deformation. Now, um, the previous slide was about how this spectrum is distributed in time. And this picture here is about how the spectrum is distributed in space. And I take um, a subduction zone as example again, where we have um, the subducting oceanic lithosphere, probably should not mark here, um, where at this upper part, let's see if we can get a different color. Okay. So at the upper part, we have this so-called locked zone. This is where the strain energy is being accumulating toward the next Mac thrust earthquake. And further down dip, we know that because of the brittle ductal transition, slip becomes stable or steadily accumulating at what we know of plate convergence rate, being 40 millimeters per year or some other numbers for your um, subduction margin. So that source of events is something being discovered in between those highly locked seismogenic zone and the stable sliding um, down the portion of the Mac thrust fault. And this is also where um, there have been quite a few lines of evidence that pore pressure is likely to be very high 
to promote those failure at um, extremely, well, I'm talking about near lithostatic pop pressure conditions. So, um, and then when we go further down dip, up dip, sorry, that we might also again transition from seismogenic behavior to stable slip because of the, um, for example, here for Cascadia, the incoming sediments being unconsolidated, very low strength, and unable to um, support co-seismic slip. So this is a kind of um, spectra of earthquake cycle deformation on the space scale. Now, um, right. So what I really want to get into is how in this two weeks of lecture, how we can use information, how we can conceptually understand information from earthquake seismology, earthquake geodesy, and numerical modeling, and try to relate that to fault behaviors. Um, because another way of seeing it is, I'm hoping after the two lectures that when you go back to the class, my understanding is that most of the students are geology students, um, that you were able to go back to your office if you happen to have a seismologist office mate or a future in your career you happen to have a seismologist colleague that those might be the starting point of how to start a conversation how to start a collaboration um, among interesting um, topics all right so i'm going to start from earthquake seismology first um, and i try to summarize a few um a few points that seismology or earthquake seismology really could help uh, or um, to illustrate the deformation of fault. Well, first of all, we all know about the earthquakes. Most of the earthquakes occur on faults. So where you see earthquake presence, they're likely to be fault that can be either be mapped on the surface or extending to the deep interior. So earthquakes are really, to the first order, is a very good, reliable indication of where the faults are. Like this map is showing, they're all, most of them are associated with major play boundaries. Now that's not surprising, but this, um, I guess what's more interesting is when you see unexpected, unexpected earthquakes highlight unexpected faults. So I try to pick uh, a few examples. Uh, one of them is from the Sumatra subduction zone. Try to highlight here. So that's the area that we're focusing here. The 2004 Sumatra magnitude 9 earthquake ruptured about that area. Let's see if we can. Oops. Okay. All right. So um, this is a different earthquake. This was a strike sip earthquake of magnitude 8.6. That's the largest strike sip earthquake ever recorded so far. And um, it happened right in the middle of the ocean within the oceanic lithosphere, where we don't expect such large events. We typically expect large, meaning magnitude eight or magnitude nine earthquakes along play boundaries. So that's definitely not a major play boundaries. Um, what's more interesting about this earthquake is it has a very, very complicated rupture path. So this paper um, by a Caltech group actually has a title, say, Earthquake in the Maze. Now what that means is that this earthquake, let me try to um, get to the details of this map here. So each of these points here, let's see, each of the points here has a color and the color corresponds to the time in seconds for the entire duration of the structure. So when we go to the top red color, that's the beginning of the rupture. And when we go to the blue color, that's the end of the rupture. And then each of the dots basically is recording what's the time and space that particular spot has released co-seismic energy. So we can follow the trace in color and we can see the earthquake actually started here that's the epi, um, the hypercenter of the earthquake and it propagated bilaterally along this initial fault segment 
And then after it reaches this point here, oops, it started to propagate at a normal, well, at another orientation that's ni almost 90 degrees from the initial fault segment, also bilaterally, based on the color of the dots. And once it reaches this third segment here, we see this earthquake try to change direction again, or it did change direction again, to another fault that's again 90 degrees from the second segment. And the propagation of the rupture is predominantly toward the northwest direction. At the same time, we had, um, well, so activity here was from, um, I think was from an aftershock, so that was not um, included as man shock rupture. So toward the end, this is a conceptual picture of how this entire magnitude 8.6, and we can convert that into energy, how this amount of energy is being released within this 160 seconds of time within that complicated rupture pass. So the, sec the fourth segment, I was not, I didn't highlight on this original map here, but that was kind of a jumping from the third segment to a fourth segment, even without obvious connection in terms of seismicity. Hey, uh, Zheng. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. The, the thing that really strikes me about this map is it looks like the magnetic anomalies are running sort of north, south, and east, west. Where there's magnetic anomalies are east, west, and there's some kind of shears offsetting them that are north, south. So all of the faults that were involved in this rupture are at a high angle to that primary fabric of the ocean floor. Am I reading that correctly? Right, so um, I didn't really expand the background color. The background color on the left side is gravity anomaly, and the, on the right side is magnetic anomalies where you would expect them because of the seafloor spreading have those kind of banded features. And um, so I was just going to erase these things here where you can see that predominantly the fabric of magnetic anomalies are roughly like that. And then you have those banded features like that. And then what, what Christy was saying that the faults, uh, yeah, the faults are all at very high angles to those lineations, which means that they are not like what we understand of oceanic transform faults or uh, the extension of transform faults being the fracture zones toward the other end of the mid-ocean ridge. So they're not following those kind of um, linear structures dominated by the spreading direction. Yeah, that's, that's still the puzzling part of the rupture. Um, so there, there, was, there was study about, um, from Greg Hurst's group, um, Greg Hurst and uh, Greg Perosa, they proposed because the depth of the earthquake was actually quite deep, it was like 50, 60 kilometers, the hypocenter. So they proposed that this earthquake, instead of being ruptured in the brittle part of the oceanic crust, they're probably involving the thermal runaway uh, mechanism, like we discussed, um, sorry, this class, and McGill discussed previously that, um, so yeah, I. I guess I don't really have a good answer to your question why they are not lining up uh, with the pre-existing other geophysical features. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's just a little intimidating for a geologist that works on the crust. <laughs> <laughs> no clues for us. <laughs> anyway, so um, I guess that's, that's like interesting part of seismology is it lights up what you normally would not assume to have like active structures. All right, um, this part uh, of the word that we're all more fully familiar with is from the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. Um, so this is roughly the border between British Columbia and Alberta. And then we know there are lots of hydraulic fracturing going on there. Um, there have also lighted up structures previously unknown to us. So this sedimentary basin um, was very quiet in, in terms of, if you just look at catalog from the Canadian Earthquake Seismological 
network, seeing as a network. Um, for the area, for example, on the right side uh, was a very small area near Fox Creek in Alberta. And then if you just go to search catalog for this area, you basically got nothing, zero seismicity before roughly 2005. And um, so all those, um, all the seismicity we're seeing now in this area, so those are clusters of seismicity. And each of them is um, very well correlated in time and in space with those fracking wells. So one of the fracking wells are showing here where you see the well head where the vertical wall goes down and you have multiple horizontal wells going in different directions. So uh, for other places, it's a bit covered by the seismicity. So this is um, a, a, a very interesting topic of research, um, at least at, in, in, in Canada and the US, is that what are the mechanisms that might have caused the generation of those fracking earthquakes? And, um, and it's also interesting to try to highlight here is whether those earthquakes and how many of the earthquakes may actually be related to pre-existing faults in the area that just because they went undetected or how many of the earthquakes were actually creating new fractures and new faults eventually to um, host this kind of release of energy. Um, all right, so that's my first point here is that the occurrence of earthquakes to the first order, they tell you where are the active structures within the earth um, there's supposed to be a second point, but I don't know why I don't have a two there. Anyway, so um, the distribution of seismicity also tells you something about the heterogeneity of the fault. Now, um, it's very hard to see from this map here because there are lots of earthquakes on it. But this is South North California. Um, so San Juan Bautista is somewhere here. Um, what well, Sandra's fault sort of runs in that dimension. Uh, what Alan Rubin has done here in this paper is he look at seismicity within this little box here. It's not really little. Within this box, and he tried to relocate the seismicity. So relocation is a common technique used by seismologists to try to get a better constraints on the location of the earthquakes so that we can use that to make inferences for the structure on the fault. So what's showing on the top map here is the original catalog from Northern California earthquake catalog. Okay, so, um, and I think there are over 2,000, probably 2,400 events in total. And what he has done is to try to look at the similarities between the waveforms of all the small earthquakes and if he can identify a nice match between the waveforms, he call this earthquake belongs to this family. So by trying to identify this multiplet, we call multiplets, sorry, I just, I just gonna write it, multiplet, are basically a group of earthquakes. It could be a few earthquakes, it could be tens of earthquakes with very similar waveform so that they can be all grouped into a single family or into one multiplet. And what this map on the bottom shows is after the identification of the multiplets, this seismicity in the, at the bottom here contains about uh, 1,600 seismicities. So that's about two thirds of the total catalog he has looked at. And what we're seeing is that we're having very, very sharp features, linear features being highlighted that was previously unknown from the catalog location. Maybe I, I should highlight here is that on the top map here, all the black dots are events that have been identified in a multiplet. So meaning that each of the black dots at the top corresponds to one black dot at the bottom. So we're seeing this really nice collapsing of events in location into sharp features 
that probably telling us about that this part of the fault, um, sorry, this is, this is a map view, or this is depth cross-sectional view, kind of looking toward the fault. So this is depth, sorry, this is depth in uh, 14 kilometers, and this is along strike direction. So we're looking at those linear features on the fault zone. Obviously, those features are more active in terms of generating seismicity than areas that are blank on this map. And this is probably telling us about that this part has either a strong or higher strength or weaker strength. We don't really know, right? Because if you try to characterize the streaks as asperities, then we're trying to relate them into stronger false material. But the other way around would be saying that those seismicities are actually representing small activity or little activity around big asperities. So let me just try to draw here. It could also mean that what I draw in hash lines, this blank area, currently no earthquake, could be having higher strength than the areas or then the top and bottom boundaries, right? because it's, it's a, higher, a higher strength asperity is trying to accumulate more strain energy towards even larger events, while the top and, so let's just try to highlight that, while the top and the bottom here are releasing energy in smaller events. So, um, it's useful in terms of seismic, precise seismicity locations of telling us about the heterogeneous distribution on the fault, but you have to still have to rely on other types of observations in order to make the interpretation, whether it is a asperity, a higher strength asperity, or it's re representing just creep session. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so here comes my second point. My second point is that Focal mechanisms that we saw from earthquakes highlights the motion of the fault. And I don't think this is anything new to everybody that, uh, for example, in my example here, I have a right lateral strike sip fault. And if I happen to have four seismometers, each of them sitting at a different quadrant from the rupture area, then I would expect that two of the quadrant would have compressional first arrival, like on this diagram here. So this is what we call polarity or first arrival polarity. So if you're sitting in the compressional quadrant from an earthquake, the first arrival is going to be up a wave going upward, and if you happen to be sitting in this dilational quadrant, the first polarity will be going down. So ideally, if we're able to cover this whole osmosal range around this epicentral area, we should be able to come up with a focal mechanism solution, like this case here on my right side, this is a case for a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake um, in Kunlun, China, where we have looked at, at the global first wave polarities. And in this case here, because the osmosal coverage is very nice, we have pretty much a station along every angle from this epicenter. So we can clearly tell some of the stations has downward motion and some of the stations has upward motion, well, except for a few that are sort of sitting at the borderline where it's very hard to tell whether it's up or down. So that's one way of solving focal mechanism solutions. There are other ways, but we're not going to touch upon here. Um, and then after that, we can try to summarize that there are three basic types of focal mechanisms, depending on what's your original stress orientation. For example, you would have reverse faulting earthquakes if maximum or sigma one is horizontal, 
and um, you would have no more fault in earthquake if uh, sigma one is vertical, and you know, will have strixive fault if the intermediate one is vertical. Okay, so three basic types of focal mechanisms can try to, or can at least give you some indication of what's the sense of motion along the fault. Now I took this example, it's, it's probably an extreme example of how focal mechanism solutions can try to tell us about the fault deformation. So this on the left side here, you're seeing um, focal mechanisms of earthquakes in the Tohoku area for the two and a half months before that magnitude, magnitude nine earthquake. So the colors here basically indicates, I think indicates depth. So that goes from the trench to further inland. And um, if we just observe those beach balls, we can clearly see that, uh, hopefully clearly see, that most of the events are thrust faulting events. Right? Those are earthquakes occurring on the play boundary. They're not big events though. They're not nines. But, but if we look at um, another, so this is another two and a half months after this man shock, we're seeing that the focal mechanisms are definitely not as, well, def definitely not the same as what we see before in terms of, um, so it's very hard to kind of tell exactly which mechanism is more dominating, but at least you're seeing a lot of normal faulting events, right? Okay, I'm not trying to highlight here, but hopefully you're seeing a lot of white quadrants compared to the red or orange or other um, quadrants. In, so we're, we're, we're starting to see a change from thrust faulting mechanism to a lot of normal faulting mechanism. And this is what um, the authors here try to break them down is to look at those are all aftershocks, the same two and a half months period aftershocks. But what they have break them down is to look at them individually, interplate. So this is interplate events. So events within a very narrow distance from the inferred subduction play boundary. Now this is very nice now that of course, because they are interpolated to be interplayed events, so the focal mechanism is dominantly thrust faulting. But it's also very interesting is that earthquake distribution now is surrounding this main shock rupture area, which is the, um, the contours here represents the main shock of that magnitude nine events. But if we go to look at, for example, events within the hanging wall and events within the foot wall. We start to see the disappearance of that dominant thrust of faulting events. Right. For example, if we focus on the hanging wall here, you can see that most of the events, at least by my eye, they are mostly normal faulting events. <coughs> and if I move to the foot wall, roughly the same thing, except for the deeper, oops, except for the blue color events, most of the events are again normal faulting. Any guess on why? Uh, yeah, Jing. Yeah? Be, before we move, can, can I ask a qu simple question? Could you draw a east-west cross section of this system to show clearly what you mean by the hanging wall, foot wall, and intraplate? <coughs> sure, yes. Okay. Um, let's see if I have stop here. Um, so I'm going to use a different color. All right, so I'm just going to draw at the bottom here. Uh, this is too. So this is the subducting uh, 
This is a subducting uh, oceanic lithosphere. Um, Japan Island is sitting here. And um, by interplate, I mean earthquakes that occur on the inferred interface between the oceanic and the overlying continental plate. So this will be the top of the oceanic lithosphere. Um, hanging wall is here. This will be the foot wall. And plate interface is here. Okay. I have a question. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, I was just wondering if they made the distinction between hanging wall and foot wall by looking at the depth or by looking at the type of focal mechanism. They look at, at um, so I didn't show here, but they, they plot the, all the seismicity onto this depth cross-sectional view. And they have from an independent study of where the plate interface would be. And then they basically group the events. They look at how many events will be within, say, three kilometers on top of the interface and three kilometers at the, beneath the interface. And those events will belong to the interplate group. And the others that's above it will go to the hanging wall group, and the others be, uh, below it will go to the foot wall group. Yeah. So my question was, um, any guess on why we're seeing so many normal faulting earthquakes in the hanging wall and um, in the foot wall? Even some of the earthquakes in the foot wall are actually outrise events, meaning events that's further seaward of the trench. Yeah, so um, it's related to the stress interaction, right? So we're going to come to that in this tutorial or the lab for the Coulomb stress. But the idea here is that once you have this large Mac thrust event with what well, near the trench, we have nearly 60 meters of offset. So with this huge amount of offset along the Mac thrust, that's going to cause large stress changes in both the hanging wall and the foot wall. Now specifically, because we're having the subduction of the ocean slab, there is a lot of, me. I draw it as almost flat here, but there is actually a lot of bending going on. Just imagine this is a play bending problem that you have the subducting slab coming in and then it's going to be dragged down. So there will be a lot of bending going on in this authorized area. And those bending will likely to be activated, or those normal faults will likely to be activated because of that stress perturbation coming from the large Mac thrust event. And the same thing here is that um, I draw very flat topography for me for the hanging wall, but there's also a lot of normal or thrust sequences within the hanging wall that could also be activated because of the stress for the evasion. So this actually could be a very interesting problem, um, try to use the Coulomb stress change and look at given this input of the main shock rupture and how the stress field will be changed surrounding this thrust fault, so meaning how stress will change in the hanging wall and stress will change in the foot wall and how that change will, will be different if we consider different orientations of these pre-existing normal faults because we're going to see that the stress change from Coulomb calculation will be very dependent on how you assume your recipient fault orientations. Okay, so um, probably went very long. Um, the third point is how earthquake seismology could be useful is we can try to estimate the different parts of energy released in the earthquake and use that again as an indication of the relative strength of the fault. 
So by that, by relative strength, I specifically mean that we can try to estimate what's the static stress drop because of a co-seismic rupture. For example, this diagram shows stress on the fault, a very simplified version of it, as a function of slip, where we have the initial stress and the peak stress. So when an earthquake occurs, it's going to rise from your initial stress to the peak stress over a very short period of time. And this is assumed here to be a rock change already. And then the stress is going to decay. Sorry, I made it wrong. The stress is going to decay with time. And this, we call it a weakening process. And I think probably Christy is going to come back to it, talk about the details of the sleep weakening or velocity weakening processes. But this is how we conceptually draw the evolution of stress on the fault during the earthquake rupture um, process. And because of this kind of diagram, simplified diagram, we can try to partition the energy released in the earthquake into how much of energy is being released by frictional heating, that's the box, rectangular box at the bottom, and how much of the energy is released by fracturing the neighboring rocks, and finally, how much of the energy is being released as radiated seismic waves. So this budget here, the fracture energy plus the radiated energy plus the frictional energy will be equal to the total energy, well, total energy, total work being done um, to this to the system. So we're not going to um, we're not going to try to solve exactly how we can get to those fracture energy or frictional energy or um, or really the energy, but we're just going to look at a, a very specific parameter, stress drop. Because the stress drop tells us how much that the fault has dropped from the peak stress to the residual stress. And this gives us idea of the strength, relative strength of the fault. So to get stress drop uh, in seismology, what we do is to look at the spectrum of a seismogram. Um, so spectrum basically means how much of the energy is being distributed as a function of frequency. So this is a frequency. This is amplitude. Amplitude. And we have some models that can fit the spectrum. That, um, again, those models assume that you have either a circular crack or rectangular crack, so we're not going to get the details. But the real key parameter that's coming out of this fitting to spectra is something we call it a corner frequency, FC. So this is basically where your spectra goes from flat toward a certain either a power of a two or a power of a three fall off rate with frequency. And with that corner frequency, we can do a lot of things. For example, here, once you have the corner frequency, um, once you also have an estimated uh, seismic moment of this event, we can estimate what's the relative stress drop delta sigma. So delta sigma is a parameter that we can directly estimate from seismic waveforms. And this is how the stress drop looks like for, um, well, for global earthquakes. So um, this, each of the earthquake is represented by uh, colored dots. And the color is proportional to the logarithm of the stress drop. For example, here, this is stress drop of one MPA. So yellowish color means one MPA. And reddish color here is three MPA. And then you go to higher orders here. This is 100 MPA toward the spectrum. Now, if we look at this global distribution of stress drops, now those are earthquakes uh, with magnitude greater than 5.5. So we're not looking at any smaller events here. But if you just observe this kind of pattern, we can already see there is difference in stress drops 
for earthquakes along subducting faults versus earthquakes from the mid ocean ridges, right? So for example, here, I'm just drawing it very roughly here, subduction zone earthquakes tend to have stress drops. Okay, if I choose green as a representative color for those events, they have earthquakes roughly of three MPA. And that's roughly true for the other subduction zones um, west of the Pacific plate, if you want to put it exactly. But if you look at mid-ocean ridge events, those earthquakes have stress drops for, of bluish colors. So they are generally higher than 10 MPA. Now I have spent, um, I've spent hours talking with my earthquake physics class students how you cannot trust the stress drop values in terms of single values of stress drops because just because all those uncertainties go into the estimate of the stress drop value. But this kind of global pattern is still valid when, especially when we're looking at two thunder earthquakes distributed over this broad range of stress drop value. So um, I guess I'm going to ask another question is why you think, why do you think that mid-ocean ridge earthquakes generally have higher stress drops than mech thrust events? I think, I think that has to do with the strength of the fault. Because you know, stress drop is the stress, if you think of a stick slip fall, a stick slip um, scenario, you have the stress builds up at the tip of the fault and starts propagating. So what we are going to see is that if the fault, if the fault strength is so high, you have to have high stress build up to be able to overcome the frictionless strength of the rock of the fault mm -hmm. to be able to initiate the rupture. Okay. So now, if you have a high stress, if you have a rock that has very high strength or a fault that has high frictional strength, you need to have higher stress to cause the rupture or to cause the deformation. At the end of the day, you find out that after the deformation or after the rupture, the stress you have at the end, if you compare it to what you had at the beginning, which is a stress drop I can't estimate, will be considerably higher. But if it's a force that has lower strength, you don't need as much stress to cause the deformation. Yes, so um, that's a point of trying to use stress drops to indicate the relative strength of the fault. But I guess what I'm trying to get to here is that stress drop tells about a relative change, right? How much you have dropped from the peak strength to a residual strength. But it doesn't really tell you much about what's the absolute stress on the fault. So if I go back to my um, diagram here, I guess, we really don't know where is zero stress on this y-axis. Right. So what we're seeing or what we're observing as the difference between sigma one and sigma two, or sigma one and sigma zero, is how much stress has been released. But it doesn't really tell you about how much stress or this, this amount of stress has been completely released on the fault. Let me just take an example. If I'm looking at a fault at 20 kilometers in depth, and if you just multiply that by the lithostatic pressure, you're going to get um, how much MPA of stress? 27 times 20. It's like 500 MPA. Roughly. OK. <laughs> well, well, it's extremely it very high stress value. But three MPA of stress drop is really a small fraction of the absolute strength that we're seeing. So um, I mean, going back to the question is why the mid-ocean ridge earthquakes tend to higher, higher stress drops. It probably has something to do with that the mech thrust events has been sitting there for a well, very long time, millions of years, some of them so that it has actually experienced a lot of large 
earthquakes. Where, um, or in that, another way of saying it is that those MAC thrust faults are very mature faults, experiencing large amount of slip in the past, so that it has been weakened enough that the stress drop will be relatively smaller compared to mid-ocean ridges where they are, well, mid-ocean ridges are the places where the newest oceanic crust has been generated. So they are young in, in terms of fault strength terms. Okay, so um, earthquake drops, um, I think I have a, I have a diagram here just to show the spread of the 2000 events that we're seeing here where the main value of stress drop is roughly 3.3 MPA with the spread that um, we're seeing. But another, another interesting observation is try to compare the stress drop values from small earthquakes to larger earthquakes. So what this plot is trying to do here is to make corner frequency versus the seismic moment. And if we go back to look at the relation between corner frequency and seismic moment in terms of stress drop is that if stress drop is a constant value, then we should expect that corner frequency FC would scale to the one third of seismic moment, right? FC would scale as minus here. All right, so, yeah. So this is how those slopes or the lines are drawn. So each of this line is drawn based on the assumption that a stress drop is a constant value of 100 MPA or 0.1 MPA. And what we're seeing here is that for the spectrum of earthquakes, that goes from order magnitude, well, it goes from magnitude one to magnitude 8.5 here, that for this broad range of events, most of the earthquakes have, earthquake, have stress drops within 0.1 and 100 MPA. Again, this is a value that's not changing much, whether you're looking at small earthquakes versus large earthquakes. All right, um, the fourth point um, related to what earthquake seismology can tell us about the structure of the fault is that seismologists can go to image the velocities, not only of the broad scale global tomography, but focusing really on this near field fault zone and try to get a sense of if this earthquake, well, if this fault has experienced tons of earthquakes in the past, each of the earthquake rupture must have created very extensive fracture networks around the fault. So we should be able to see that signature of the fracture network or damage from velocity structures, because we know that seismic velocity, um, VP or VS, whichever you want to, is related to the elastic moduli and the density of the material that it's propagating through. So fault damage definitely has an effect on the velocity structure. And this is um, exactly what, so I pick an pick example from, again, um, this is the North Antonio fault, I think. Um, because the idea here is that if we go look at exactly, so this blue line here is a fault trace. And what we're looking at is seismogram from a station VO, which is sitting exactly on the fault, and then seismogram from a station of FP that's sitting 400 meters away from the fault. So this is less than half kilometer of distance, but what we're seeing in the, same, in the waveforms is huge difference in terms of the acceleration, for example. 
So this is acceleration at VO, that station right at the fault, and FP 400 meters away from the fault. We see the strong amplification effect. And this is due to primarily due to the damaged fault shocks that where the waves are being reflected multiple times trapped within this damaged fault zone and that accelerate or that it enhanced the ground motion if we're sitting exactly on the fault versus if you're moving some distance away from the fault. So um, yeah, so the damage zone structure is definitely important, not only just for generic scientific study, but also for hazard point of view. Um, and this is another study try to look at how if you have a low velocity zone, for example, here, those red lines are the fault interfaces. And this is a range 500 meters away from the interface. This whole range is assumed to have lower velocities because of a high degree of damage. And we see the wave propagation is very different compared to the case where we have homogeneous materials. Very different in terms of, so the density of the blue and red basically highlights this, the intensity of ground shaking. So the way that seismologists can image this kind of fault damage structure is to rely again on the different phases on the seismogram. Now, um, this is an ex experiment. This experiment is, if you line up, oh, can't do that. If you line up a set of seismometers right across the fault zone, okay, and then each of them are just going to be separated by 50 meters in horizontal distance. This is a map view here on the left side. And this is a depth cross-sectional view of how that fault zone extends to depths and how if the earthquake is sitting, I'm just going to get to the, so let's try to maybe illustrate here is if you have a fault zone that's extending to depths, it doesn't have to be a vertical fault. And if you have an earthquake that's sitting here and you have stations across the fault zone, you're going to have direct P arrival to the station but you're also going to have, let's see if I can do this right. So what I try to do here is to draw the ray path of the seismic wave because as it enters this false zone, it's a low velocity zone. So it will be refracted and be reflected back to this west side and seen by the station, let's say station number one again. Now because of the extra path that the wave has to travel, the second phase arrival will be later than the first phase, than the direct arrival here. So if we can track the exact arrival times of the first phase and the reflected phase, we should be able to use that information to infer for what's the velocity structure of this low velocity zone here. And this is exactly what this diagram on the right side is trying to show that those are seismograms line up for stations going from, so we're, oops. So we have stations going from the east toward west west toward east, and they are lined up in this direction here. So what you can see is that for stations and the fault zone is within this range here. So we can see that for stations to the west side of the fault zone, there is nice separation in your first arrival and your reflected wave and then those are just waves being reflected multiple times 
kind of bouncing back and forth and then going to the same station again. And for stations to the east side of the fault, we're also seeing the same phases. But when you look at stations that's exactly sitting within the fault zone, we have kind of V-shaped of phases. And this is because that the, 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 the rays or the ray path has been reflected multiple times and has been exactly, well, I don't know how to draw this ray path here, but it has to be um, received at the station sitting next exactly on the fault zone. And this travel time delay tells us information about the structure of the fault zone. Now you can do the same thing for S wave on the right side, but we're not going to get to the details here. Um, the other type of formation is that if your earthquake happens to sitting exactly within the fault zone, it gets more complicated because it's sending waves both sides of the and in the ground. So this is width, this is the depth. So depth will be to what depth that this low velocity zone ex extends to that can still be seen by those traveling paths. And you can also get information of how much of reduction in speed that the fall zone has for P and for S waves, right? Because we're looking at the low velocity zone. So whether it's 50% it's lower than your surrounding wall rocks or it's 30%. So those are information we're trying to extract, that modules can try to expect, uh, extract from those waveforms. And in the end, you come up with, compare your observations to your data and model, try to minimize your error, so it's error here is represented by color. So uh, when I go from red to purple, basically it means reducing the misfit between data and model. But if you look at this kind of diagram here, this is the width of the fault zone and the drop in P or S wave speed. Now what this kind of diagram is trying to tell us is that there is not a unique solution in terms of finding the optimal combinations of width and P wave re reduction, right? Because if you look at, for example, this trend here, this trend pretty much had the same misfit in terms of RMS, RMS error, but you could say that this fault has 350 meters of width for about 35% of P wave reduction, or you could also say that this fault zone is about 270 meters in width with, with about 48% of P wave reduction. So there is always a trade-off between how precise you can image the width of the fault zone, the depths that extend, and how much of reduction of PNS waves in, in, within this fault zone. Um, I'm just going to uh, finish one more slide and then we'll take a break here. So um, this slide is about how we can also try to image this kind of low velocity zones for oceanic transform faults. Um, so this is, uh, well, this is a sequence of transform faults in East Pacific rise. And what Emily Rowland has done here is to do an active source line across the Gofar fault, so Gofar is to the west and the Cabrera is to the 
right side. And then she used those active source experiment to image the velocity structure beneath the transform faults. So one of product here, so this is the profile for go far fault, this profile here. And we're going from, um, I think we're going from, yeah. So we're going from south to north in this direction. We're going in this direction. So what we're seeing is we're also seeing this low velocity zone here. We're seeing a very, very wide low velocity zone where the P wave speed is almost 20 or 30 percent lower than what's expected. So when we see low velocity zone, it's basically comparing what's the value within the fault zone to the value outside the fault zone at the same depth. So one of the one of the mechanisms that we propose to, to explain this kind of broad scale or low velocity zones for oceanic transform faults is that you have very intense fracturing again because it's a transform fault where the mid ocean ridges are trying to spread in opposite directions on both sides on either side of it. And you also have strong hydrothermal circulation near the surface. Well, that's I mean, at the bottom of the ocean or near the surface of the fault. So that strong shear motion and very strong hydro, hydromal circulation has contributed to um, increase the porosity of the oceanic crustal material. Where in this paper, Emily Rowland also tried to calculate what would be the increase in porosity um, because of those mechanisms that we just talked about. And then she calculated if you have about 10% of porosity increase, that could be used to explain the reduction of P wave speeds of 20%. So that's one mechanism. Um, she also looked at another mechanism like mineral alteration, because you could expect that they have serpentinization going on here for, um, for oceanic crust material. But that mechanism was ruled out as, as at least the leading mechanism, because if you want to have 20% of P wave reduction, the amount of mineral alteration, so I don't have the figure here, but the alteration in terms of density, right? density goes to seismic velocities, the amount of density change would have given you a gravity signal that could have been picked up by um, the marine altimetry, marine gravity um, observations. So um, in the end, the preferred that this porosity increase of the oceanic crust material as a leading mechanism for explaining those low velocity zones. Um, I guess I, I should probably take a break here since it's already 2.45. We'll come back in, how many minutes do we really take? 10, seven. Uh, so we're gonna come back at the two fifty two. Here.